Good, good morning, everyone. I hope it's still morning. It's, uh, it's, uh, thank you for this invitation. I, the, uh, I would like to talk about cinema, which is my field. And uh, one of the things that the word that, that we usually use uh, when we talk about cinema, our experience of cinema, is uh, entertainment. Uh, whereas uh, what I want to talk about today is engagement. Uh, not, just being, uh, not just being engaged by what is happening on screen, but the other thing, which is actively engaging with what is happening on screen, that is putting ourselves out there. And thus I come to the topic of today's uh, talk, uh, lateral thinking, cinema and lateral thinking. Now, what, the thing about that, what is, what is lateral thinking? The solving of problems by an indirect and creative approach, typically through viewing the problem in a new and unusual light. What we're talking about is some as a kind of interpretation. When it comes to art and we apply this concept, we're talking about a kind of interpretation, which is which is basically saying within the same framework, within the same the, the, the framework, we are we're talking about a new way of thinking, a fresh way of thinking and approaching uh, the, this problem so we can solve it for ourselves. What is this problem though? Can we can we think of Film as being a problem. When you talk about problems, uh, you know, maths has problems, where engineering has problems, life has problems. Uh, what about cinema? How can cinema be a problem that needs a solution? Yeah, so can cinema be viewed as a problem? I would say yes, because we're talking, when we're talking about problems and solutions, we're talking about finding meaning in cinema, which is sometimes the, the, the film does not always give us all the things that we want from frame to frame to frame to frame. So sometimes we have to step in and, uh, you know, like find out the meaning for ourselves. The problem give, is posed on screen. We have to create the solution or the meaning. And, and I want to simplify it to just one aspect of meaning, which is to what is the meaning of this single shot? That is what we, we mean. It's the most basic uh, thing when something comes on something comes up on screen. Now let us take this most uh, this this uh, this series of scenes from uh, the the film The Godfather. All of you must have seen it. Most of you must have seen it. Uh, it's by Francis Ford Coppola. This particular thing is the uh, see, uh, see, sequence is from the the scene where. Uh, this gangster named Clemenza orders the assassination or carries out the assassination of an underling called Polly Gatto. That is the scene. Now, when we look at it, there is, you just think of, forget, forget looking at this, at, at this slide and just imagine one person is killing another, right? That is the content of the scene. That is the crux of the scene. What, 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 what can a filmmaker do? That How do you present it? You can show uh, somebody, you know, uh, pulling a trigger, the other person falls dead. Or you can even, uh, you know, uh, have, the, have the event occur off screen because this is not such a major character that, you know, you have to show this person being murdered on screen. So there are many ways you could do that. But look at how Coppola does it. He, he shows the car containing Clemenza, the person who's going to carry out the assassination, and Polly Gatto, the person who's going to be assassinated, the three people. They're backing out of their very crowded neighborhood. They're going through the city, then they're going towards the outskirts, and finally they park the car here, which is where the assassination takes place. So when you see something as simple as a killing being de depicted in such an elaborate fashion, your mind starts thinking, okay, let me re rephrase that, backtrack a bit and say, at least one kind of mind starts thinking. There are some people who are just content to say, I'm going to eat my popcorn and I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to just watch the movie and not really like think too much or analyze too much or, you know, get into it, which is perfectly fine because we cannot always, you know, dictate how we respond to anything or, or you know, the newspaper headlines or anything else. But if you're the other kind of person who wants to kind of get engaged with it, you want to think about it, the very fact that there is a, there is a sequence of events happening like this makes your brain, you know, start ticking, you know, you start thinking about it and say, why is this happening? Why are we show, being shown such an elaborate, uh, uh, you know, sequence of events for a simple killing of an unimportant person, right? So then you could say that maybe the point is to, you start creating. So that is the problem. The problem is why, and now the mind starts creating solutions. So you start thinking maybe, okay, maybe one, one reason is that you want to show the, you know, the, you, just like, just like we, like Polly Gatto himself, the person who's going to be assassinated, just like he doesn't know that this is going to happen, 
exactly when maybe the directors trying to you know expand time and not let us you know know when this is going to happen so he's keeping us in the same state of suspense that is one you could interpret it that way or you could interpret it as the another way you could get into a metaphorical zone where you're saying they start with this 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 civilization surrounded by houses and all that is where they live and they basically this 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 wild place with all these wild reeds is the 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 is is kind of represents the kind of work that they do so the distance between this and this is actually what is being shown in the shot so you could maybe get into a metaphorical zone and interpret it this way so there are many many uh, things that you could do here but <laughs> even if you are the popcorn muncher even if you are the kind of person who is not is terribly interested in in doing this kind of thing the scene still has meaning because there is action because whenever there is action or whenever there is dialogue by action i mean whenever it's not necessarily an action sequence but whenever somebody is doing something or whenever somebody is speaking something that is action or dialogue whenever action or dialogue is happening on screen we are in the loop because somebody is either doing something and we look at them and say okay they're doing this therefore this means that or they're saying something and we say okay they're saying this and therefore it means that but when it comes to thought being depicted on screen it becomes a little more complicated because now no, nobody is doing action and nobody is speaking dialogue they're just thinking so i'll move on to the next slide from yuki azali's film love archkal which is this film where uh, the self character and the deepika padukone character at the beginning of the film they break up and they remain friends and at this point what happens is that uh, they uh, uh, he finds that uh, you know he finds a girl that he likes and he uh, he sends deepika a message saying there are different continents at this point he sends her a message saying i am ready to move on so uh, she looks at the message now now the what we get now is we get the fact that the message she looks at the message on her phone and there is no uh, conversation at all it's just a series of shots that depicts what what she's thinking right so she looks at the message then she goes and stands in front of the mirror then she smiles then she turns and looks looks at a like like a profile in the mirror then she loosens her hair she does that then she again looks looks at the mirror some more so we get a series of shots where this person is not doing anything or saying anything very very specific but just hanging in there for a minute and we have to now take the we have, now we have to try to see okay what exactly is happening here the problem is this is happening what is the solution how do we what do we what do we do in order to get into her frame of mind and that is when we start thinking about okay so now this person sent her a message saying that he has moved on now it's her her point is like am i ready to move on am i looking good okay this is a very ridiculous proposition because this is deepika padukone we are talking about but at the same point this is what the story is and we've got to buy it so we're talking about am i ready to move on do i look good do i you know am i have i put on weight am i looking you know is, is this thing suiting me my do i look better with my hair tied up or like should i let my hair loose so all these things are happening in there and we are kind of uh, you know interpreting that we are kind of we are being forced to into a zone where we have to apply our own thoughts in order to get into the thoughts of this person on screen now this is still a relatively easier instance of of uh, getting into a thought frame of mind because we just saw we just saw self message coming therefore this series of frames springs from that so there is an immediate basis from which the the uh, uh, you know the the, the uh, these scenes happen now look at this this scene, uh, set of scenes from taxi driver where uh, where robert in europe plays this character called travis bickle who has dated this woman and this woman dumps him and now he's not unable to accept this rejection so he is this is a very classic scene in which he is trying to call her we don't know whether she's still listening or whether she's hung up or whatever so he's at this pay phone and the series of scenes that is one this is two this is three and this is four now what happens is the the camera the most interesting thing that happens here is the camera starts here and it moves here and it slowly starts gliding to the right so it it starts with him and then it starts here and then look at robert in here it's here and then the camera moves away from him and stops here where it so where it zones where it kind of focuses on the corridor at the, at the far distance you see people walking you see a cars moving and all that kind of stuff now now the thinking person now you immediately if you if you're kind of person who wants to know what the meaning is you're going to immediately think the camera typically focuses on the person that is doing the action 
Why is the camera now moved away to a place where there is nothing happening, where there is no action? So that is again a problem. How do you solve this problem? Now again you have to come up with solutions, you have to think laterally, you have to come up with fresh ideas within the same framework because the framework is still the same. You cannot invent something and kind of you know get into this. Within what is happening here is where you've got to find your meaning. So th then you can say, okay maybe because this person is be becoming a little alienated, maybe the camera itself is alienating itself from him. Maybe that's why it's moving. Or maybe you could say the camera is, is being kind to him and it wants us to spare the humiliation that this man is going through. So the camera is kind of you know moving away and that's what is happening. Maybe that's another interpretation. Or maybe the lonely and desolate corridor that is there is a metaphor for uh, Travis Bickle's own loneliness and you know desolation and despair. So maybe that's what's happening. So you know there are many many kind of uh, meanings here. A lot of people have problems with this kind of thinking with this kind of interpretation. Why? Because we are primarily a maths and science oriented, uh, we come from that kind of education. So what does that teach us? One problem, one solution. That is a major thing. If you look at a question paper, what typically happens is that there is only what, one right answer. And what is that right answer? The right answer is whatever the teacher uh, has, has uh, you know, uh, is, decides is that's the right answer. So that is what we know. So this multiplicity of answers or interpretations or thinking, that is a little confounding to some people. And who is the teacher when it comes to movies? The author, the director. So there is usually the question of author's intent versus aesthetic interpretation. Now, author's intent, aesthetic interpretation is a particular emotional or experiential understanding of art which we just, you know, showed with these examples. There are some people who fall squarely in the author's intent uh, category where they say the only meaning of anything is what the author said, what the director said, what the writer said, what the painter said. That is the only meaning and there is no other meaning, which is one cap. I'm not saying that is invalid, but I do not subscribe to that for the simple reason is that unlike painting, unlike writing, film is not done by one person. It is a collective endeavor and whatever the author, the director had in mind at the beginning while the film was being conceived, go through a number of iterations and as each person steps in to collaborate, the cinematographer, the editor, the so-and-so, the costume designer, the vision gradually, I'm not saying it changes, but it, it kind of shifts form and shape in, into a sum, something which the author may not have originally had in mind. So that is one thing. So the, the second thing is also that it is very difficult to know what the author had in mind unless the author is sitting right next to you and whispering after each scene, okay, this is what I meant, okay, this is what I meant by this scene. That is not happening. Even if you see a director's commentary which happens in a DVD and things like that, they are only sitting back and talking about maybe certain scenes. They are not sitting and explaining each and every scene, each and every shot. That is still something that you have to do. So I would then look at Jaws. Now this is a classic example of, of a movie that is hailed for its great direction, rightly so, Spielberg directed it very very well. But there is one particular aspect of this film where the, the sh you don't see the shark all that much. You, so a lot of people tend to think that, that uh, you know, you, it is basically Spielberg's uh, genius that he kept the shark hidden from us because, you know, he does not want to, you know, he, he kind of kept the shark hidden and just kind of, he's using that we don't, because we don't see the shark all that much, we imagine it much as, as a much more scary thing than it actually is. So it kind of builds that terror more than if we actually saw the shark. But what actually happened on the set was that the shark, the mechanical shark that they built was malfunctioning. So they could not actually use the shark that they built the, to the extent that they could. So Spielberg was forced to adopt this method in order to, uh, you know, thing. and by, by chance it became this brilliant thing because we could not see the shark and therefore we started imagining it. So we don't really know what happens behind the scenes of the film enough to gauge what an author's intent. It is my contention. That is why, you know, it is perfectly valid to, you know, to, to within the same framework go with you know, problem solving in terms of interpretation. Let us, uh, there are some places where authorial intent still matters. So I'm not saying that the author's intent is completely invalid or it doesn't matter at all. Now let us take painting because when we talk of painting, what we're talking about in relation to cinema is a single frame. A cinema is 24 frames per second. A painting is one single frame. And this is a painting, a classic painting called Supper at Emmaus. It was by the Renaissance painter Caravaggio, which depicts, it, it's a freeze frame of the moment where Two disciples, two apostles of uh, Christ, 
this is after the, the crucifixion. They invite a stranger to supper and when the stranger breaks bread and blesses the bread, he discovers that, uh, they discover that, oh my God, this is no stranger, this is actually Christ himself, he has been resurrected and that is when this happens. So that is the supper of Emmaus and that is the scene being shown. So you basically you have uh, Christ at the center, the two disciples here and the innkeeper who doesn't understand what's happening and he's behind. Now, if you look at it, you look, you look at the thing, so the freeze is the one precise moment, right? The, the, if you look at it, the, 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 now look at it in terms of technique. The whole frame is lit by a single beam of harsh light that's coming out from the outside in and it illuminates Christ's face and from there the other faces are being illuminated. That's one thing. Yeah, so that's like like the flash of recognition, the flash of light, you know, lightning that comes to us when, oh my God, this is what it really is. That's happening in this in this painting. Then if you look at it, Christ has no beard. He's usually represented with a beard. So we don't recognize this person as Christ because he's a, he seems like a stranger. That is, and therefore they don't recognize him as Christ either. So that's going on here. Then if you look at it, you know, all gazes lead to him. Like in the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci, you have all the people's eyes, this person, this person, this person, they're all looking towards Christ. They're all gazes lead towards him. And even the doubter, the innkeeper, who's not really clued in, he, he, his shadow falls behind Christ and forms a kind of halo. So that's again a connection being made there. And look at the technique, the, the action of the people here, they are, they are in motion. Whereas this person is still, that is something that's happening here. And to, to explain this all, you have, you have to understand one thing, which is like, this was the period of the Counter-Reformation, the 16th century, when the, the, the Catholic Church was, was creating lots of works of art in order to counter the onslaught of Protestantism. So what happened was they wanted to, uh, they wanted painters and sculptors and all these people, they wanted people not just to believe or read these stories from the Bible, but actually put themselves into these stories, participate in these stories, and uh, you know, become part of these stories. And how do you do that? How do you make people enter like something like a painting? That's what Caravaggio's genius comes in. See, usually a canvas is a division between our world and the paint and the world of the painting, right? It's a distance. So if you see a sunset, we are here, the sunset is miles and miles and miles away. So there is a huge distance between what is here and what is there and the painting. Now, when I talk of canvas, also keep thinking in your mind that I'm also talking about a cinema screen. But what, what Caravaggio does is that he forces, because he, his wall is just a few feet away from the canvas, the whole thing seems to be pushed forward towards us. So, so that, that's again something that, that, that he did, which is look, look to partic make us participate in this, in this whole thing. So the, 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 this person's hand, if you look at it, it's coming out of the frame, that's coming out of the, uh, uh, this one itself, you know, that person's elbow is coming out of the uh, frame and uh, you know, the, the innkeeper again is kind of involved in that. So, so what I wanted to say with this is basically, with this, we kind of get into the zone of interpretation or lateral thinking, which is very, very uh, helpful, I think. I think when we kind of look at, look at films, uh, it, it helps us expand our thoughts and also builds on the literature of the film. So along with, like for instance, when you look at literature, nobody knows what Shakespeare really thought when, when, when he wrote Hamlet. It was just basically kind of, uh, uh, you know, something that, that's there. But over the years, the number of layers that have added to it have kind of, you know, enriched the work. And I think that, that this kind of lateral thinking, this kind of interpretation enriches the film uh, much more than what the original text is. Thank you.